Greetings and welcome to the Superb Diamond Range podcast. I'm your host, Superb, broadcasting from Edinburgh. This is episode 52 and the first of 2024, so it's great to be back today. We have a returning guest who needs no introduction, as he's very well-known legend in the financial independence space, J.L. Collins, the author of The Simple Path to Wealth, one of my favourite investment finance books of all time, as well as the author of the fantastic blog, JL Collins NH, also known as the Stock Series. Um, if you enjoy the content, please remember to like and subscribe to the podcast show on YouTube or Apple Podcasts. Our website is www.superbdiamondrange.com and our Twitter is super, at Superb Diamond Range. As always, as this is part of a financial series, I have included a brief financial disclaimer in the show notes. But to summarise, the opinions in the podcast video show our own views and opinions and should not be followed. We would always recommend seeking financial advice or tax advice from a qualified financial advisor or tax professional. Right, without further ado, uh, welcome back, JL. And how are you doing? I'm I'm doing well, well, Stephen, and uh, it's a pleasure to be back. Thanks for putting up with me again. (laughs) No problems. It's good to have you back. So, yeah, obviously, um, one of the things that's changed since the last time we we recorded a, a podcast was obviously you've, you've you've released a new book, Pathfinders. Um, please tell my listeners a little bit about it and what inspired you to write it. Yeah, so Pathfinders is a collection of about a hundred stories, ranging from a few paragraphs to a few pages that we gathered from all over the world and from people in all different financial situations and walks of life who have read The Simple Path to Wealth and who are following the lessons in it uh, and adapting those lessons to their own unique environment and situation and challenges. And what inspired me to do it is almost from the beginning of publishing The Simple Path to Wealth back in 2016, I started hearing from people about how the book had impacted their lives and how they were applying the lessons. And I always enjoyed hearing those stories. I found them endlessly fascinating and and a little bit surprising, frankly, because I wrote The Simple Path to Wealth for one person, my daughter, mm-hmm. who was at the beginning of her journey and, you know, and obviously an American as I am. And and so it's a fairly U.S. centric book. And, and, uh, and yet, As I say, people from all over the world found value in it. And people who were not at the beginning of their journey, as my daughter was, but at all different stages of their own journeys, and sometimes they had to unwind lifestyle decisions they'd made or other investment decisions they'd made. So I just, yeah, I found those stories inspirational and fascinating. And and, uh, I thought maybe uh, uh, my readers would as well. So that's where it comes from. And do you find it easy to stay motivated writing the book? You know, do you have like a s- structure or schedule that you follow to kind of, or a deadline that you have to complete by or anything like that? And Well, this time it was actually considerably easier uh, because this is the first time, this is my third book, and this is the first time that I've, I've had a publisher. Uh, the first two books I self-published, and that requires, uh, in many ways, at least for me, a lot more self-discipline to stay on course. But having a publisher partner, and I had a wonderful editor at uh, Harriman House, which is actually a UK uh, publisher. Uh, you know, my editor Chris was a wonderful partner in this project, and so Chris sort of sort of set the pace, right? He would. He would periodically, uh, you know, say, "Okay, now we need to do this part of it or that part of it." And, and uh, in fact, towards the end, every time I thought I was done, I'd, I'd get an email from Chris saying, "Okay, now we need to do this or that." <laughs> and and uh, but it was it was wonderful, and and uh, he was just a superb partner in the uh, in the process and brought a lot of value to the to the book. So yeah, this one was in many ways probably the easiest book I've done. Oh, great. Nice one. Um, okay, so jumping straight into investments, um, what what are your thoughts on bonds these days? Um, in the UK, and no doubt around the world, 
we've experienced a lot of inflation and the central banks have responded by increasing interest rates. Uh, do you still uh, think some percentage of bonds are worth holding, particularly during the preservation stage? Yeah, so my opinion on bonds has not changed. And that is that, that at certain stages in your life, and it's an individu individual decision, and you mentioned the wealth preservation stage is, describes that stage, I think bonds are a good thing to add to your portfolio as ballast. So the criticism I got when interest rates were low was, well, you know, bonds aren't paying anything or they're paying very, very little in the way of, of, uh, of interest. And of course that was true. You know, in the, you go back a, a couple of decades and you could get a pretty nice uh, return on your bonds from, from the interest payments. But more recently, that was not true. Well, then, of course, as you mentioned, inflation suddenly sprung up, which had not been an issue since back in the early 80s. And, of course, central banks uh, responded by raising interest rates. Well, when interest rates go up, the value of bonds are going to drop, right? Because nobody's going to buy your bond paying 3% if they can buy a bond, a new bond paying 5%, at least not with an adjustment without an adjustment in the price of that bond. So in 2022, bonds had one of the most difficult years they have ever had. And they took some pretty pretty hefty capital losses. Very unusual uh, point in time that, that made that happen. But that's the world of investing. Unusual things, and sometimes they're not good things, do happen and we just have to endure them. But that doesn't mean that you change your strategy. So yeah, I still recommend bonds. They're still still good ballast. And at this point, uh, they're actually paying a fairly decent return for a change. And, and if you got over that, that uh, hit to your, your capital uh, uh, loss on them in 2022, that's kind of a nice thing to have. And again, we're holding these things for the long term. So that loss is only on paper. It's not gonna matter over the decades. Similar to equities, isn't it? As long as you you hold on to it, that's that's what it's all about, really. Not yeah, giving up on it. Yeah, ex ex except that people don't expect and shouldn't have to expect such a major change in the value of their bonds. That was what made that year particularly unique. But again, that's the exception rather than the rule. You know, you're always typically going to have much more volatility with your equities than you are with your bonds. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, it was unusual because it was the first time you'd see sort of both of them going down at the same time as opposed to one moving one way, one moving the other sort of thing. Right. Or one staying stable while the other, you know, typically bonds, again, they, they're they there to smooth the ride to provide ballast. So typically, typically they're the stable part of your portfolio. But in 2022, that was not the case. And it was it was a brutal year. It was pretty. Yeah, you. In the UK, it was really bad. We had a uh, three prime ministers, one after the other, in a really short amount of time. There was a lot of political problems happening, and it, it really affected the bond market, as you say, in twenty two. Um, I suppose you had a lot of things going on as well, like the UK and Russia war. Um, but yeah, it really, really made an impact, sort of thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's always going to be something going on in the world, Definitely. and. And yet, you know, you, you, you can still build wealth. The equities still tend to trend up because humans are always striving to accomplish things and to create things and to solve problems. And when you invest uh, in equities, you, you get to go along for that ride in a very positive way. Definitely. Um, just on, on the sort of talk of obviously you know, stocks and bonds, obviously you get mixed or blended portfolios. I just wanted to know what, what are your thoughts on uh, portfolios that, that use lifestyling um, or as Vanguard calls them, target date funds um, or even the life strategy funds by Vanguard uh, versus obviously DIY investing? Yeah, so just to, to define those two things, a life strategy fund, at least the way Vanguard does it, and I think this is universal, Basically, uh, you can choose different allocations, but it is what's called a fund of funds. 
and that is that it has different funds in different categories. So it typically in Vanguard in the U.S. at least it'll it'll have uh, a fund that has U.S. equities. It'll have a fund that has international equities. It'll have international bonds. It'll have U.S. bonds. It'll hold some cash. And the idea behind it is you don't have to worry about adjusting those allocations because the fund will do it for you. So if you buy a fund that says it's going to be 60% in U.S. equities, well, if U.S. As, if U.S. equities rise uh, in in uh, at a great to a greater extent than the other than the other uh, funds that it's holding, it will automatically sell some of those to buy some of those other funds and therefore adjusting your allocation for you. So in many ways, it's the very simplest way to invest. It's not my preferred way because I like to have a little more control, but for those people listening who want the absolute simplest way to really set it and forget it and all they have to do is just put money in as often as they can, I think they're, they're a wonderful tool to use. A life strategy fund is pretty much the same thing with in that it's a fund of funds in different uh, different asset categories with one key difference and that is the allocations between those categories adjust as you age so the idea behind that is sort of the traditional way of thinking that as a person gets older a greater percentage of their net worth ought to be in bonds in fixed income that tends to be more stable and a, a uh, that those kinds of funds will make that adjustment for you automatically so typically you'll choose one that'll say it's a retirement in 2030 which is pretty close and that'll be uh, that'll be already pretty heavily weighted towards bonds and you can go out further and further on those retirement dates and the further out you go the more heavily weighted towards equities it will be and then as you get closer to that date that will begin to gradually shift again i'm not a huge fan of those because i like more control and i don't necessarily think that the amount of bonds you hold in your portfolio should be tied to your age i think especially for an audience of people pursuing financial independence there are some other variables it's more about whether you have earned income at any given point in time so a lot of the people who read my work uh, they might retire that is give up their day jobs in their 30s well in that case you'd want to add, add bonds then and then maybe five six years later in their 40s they start a business or they decide to go back to work well now you're you shifted again into the into the earning to the wealth building so maybe you want to move out of bonds at that point so it's i think the, the people i'm talking to have a, uh, a more diverse life experience than the traditional work 40 years and retire that those funds are geared towards but if they suit your needs again just like the life strategy funds they are the simplest way to go about investing and can be very effective yeah, because the life strategies in the UK are, are really quite popular um, that, that Vanguard offer over here. But one of the things I've noticed is that they're very heavily weighted to the home market. So in our case, I think 25% of it is to the UK. Mm. Uh, but we sort of feel that it should be closer to 4% or 5% for the UK. So it's quite overweight UK. And I guess in America, the life strategies will not only have American, but it will have some international as well um I'd, I'd imagine but but yeah that's what's always put me off them you know as opposed to just picking a global tracker you know that's weights. interesting and that's something i i didn't know you've just educated me i didn't realize that in the uk it would have that heavy a weighting in the uk the same that's also true in the us but the us is such a large market that that makes sense to be overweighted in the us it would even in my opinion makes sense for people who are living outside of the US. But if you're in a market like the UK or actually really any market other than the US market, 
Um, I don't think those markets are large enough, and sometimes they're not diverse enough to really want to overweight them. So I imagine that Vanguard's doing that to cater to the patriotic feelings that people in the UK might have. And that's well and good, but it's not necessarily the right investment strategy. If, if I were going to be, uh, and I invest solely in the US, uh, but if I were international, I would be buying a world fund. Yeah. And, and a world fund these days, I think, is like 50, 60 percent U.S. And yeah. then the balance is made up of, of the rest of the world. And and that, too, will change because, you know, since World War Two, uh, when you know coming out of World War Two, the United States was the only country that that wasn't in ashes. And so not surprisingly, you know, in the immediate years after the war, the U.S. was pretty much was the world economy. But yeah. then as Europe and Asia rebuilt, you know, two things happened. One is their slice of the pie got bigger and bigger. The U.S. slice of the pie got smaller and smaller. But the pie itself was getting much larger. So everybody was gaining. And so now the U.S. is down to, I don't know, 50 percent of the pie or something like that from maybe 95 percent. That might sound bad for Americans, but the truth is the pie is so much bigger that it's it's a great thing. And it's certainly a great thing for the rest of the world. I think that trend will continue. I think the pie will continue to get bigger. And I think as other economies continue to blossom, the U.S. slice will get smaller. But again, that's not bad for the U.S., Definitely. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to uh, move on to get your opinion on uh, annuities and, and, you know, people taking annuities in retirement, just what your opinion of them were, was. Yeah, I'm not an expert in annuities, but I have to say I've, I've never read anything about them that makes them sound remotely appealing to me. Uh, you know, they, they and, and then when you say annuities, they're there's a huge range of, of products that fall under that category. And I think the only kind of annuity anybody should ever consider is just the most basic, uh, the simplest sort of annuity. I forget off the top of my head what they're called. Uh, but the problem with annuities, in, in my view, there are multiple problems. One is they tend to be laden with fees, and fees are a huge uh, drain on on your returns. Number one, number two is you're dependent on the insurance company you buy them from surviving. And of course, people who talk about annuities will say, "Well, you need you need to research the insurance company and make sure that they are highly rated and, and what have you." But if we know anything about the market, sometimes there are very ugly surprises that nobody anticipates. You know, back in 07, 08, you know, there's a company called Enron that, you know, was doing famously well and it was kind of a lionized company. And then a few things went wrong and in 18 months it was bankrupt. So you just don't necessarily know, no matter how highly, how highly rated a company is, what the longevity is. Now, of course, people who are annuity fans will push back and say, well, yes, but these things typically carry government guarantees. And so your money is protected. And that may be true, but there's also going to be a wait while if, if your insurance company fails, while all of that gets sorted out yeah. and, and you get paid. And then the final thing I don't like about annuities, well, not the final thing, but the last thing I'll bore you with, <laughs> is that you can't buy them indexed to inflation. And when you buy an annuity, basically what you're doing is you're giving the insurance company a lump sum of money, and they in turn then promise to send you a typically a monthly check for the rest of your life. And that sounds great. But that monthly check, the amount of it isn't going to change. But with inflation over time, the buying power of that monthly amount can change, and it can change dramatically if we get a bout of high inflation that lasts for a while. It looks, like, yeah. it looks like this particular inflation that we've had is, is not going to have long legs, but 
I, you know, I, I came of age in the 70s where there was a decade of, of high inflation. Well, that would decimate the buying power of your, of your monthly check. So I'm not a huge fan. And of course, I said that was the final thing. The last thing that occurs to me when talking about this is once you give the insurance company that lump sum of money, that's theirs. So your heirs, for instance, will never see it. If you're going to leave money to charities, your charities will never see that money. It's gone forever. So I just think there are better ways to give yourself a, an income in your retirement. That, that last reason you gave is, is, is one of the reasons what's always put me off as well. It's the idea that you could build your own portfolio that will keep growing you know, throughout time. Um, and obviously, whenever, as you say, you're capping how much you're going to get, you know, in the in the annuity contract, you know, obviously how much you're going to get. Whereas if you have a portfolio that has potential to grow, you know, for, and it can be passed on to to family and, and what have you. So that's that's one of the things that I like about it. But yeah, it always put me off with the annuities. Yeah. So I again, I've I've yet to come across. I mean, I understand that. People like the idea of having a guaranteed yeah. income for the rest of their life. And if you have a particularly long life, maybe that works out. But but I think the the, the drawbacks and the fees outweigh that advantage. Definitely. Um, we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but are you still very much a believer of investing exclusively in the USA total market? equities or would you consider adding some international equity for for extra diversification yeah that's, that's a great question and it's one that i i think about a lot so i'm uh you know i'm on record of i i invest in in solely in the u.s specifically in vtsax which is vanguard's total stock market index fund and then in their total bond fund because i'm an old guy um but it's something I think about a lot. And when I'm talking to an international audience like yours, it's not what I recommend. So I would not recommend that anybody in the UK invest exclusively in the UK. But I also wouldn't recommend uh, that if I, if I were living in the UK or anywhere outside the US, I don't think I'd feel comfortable investing entirely in the US in, in a country that's not my own. So I think if I were elsewhere in the world, I would already take the step to go into that world fund that we talked about earlier. But even as, as a U.S. Uh, uh, citizen, uh, as I touched upon a, a moment ago, as I see the world pie continuing, continuing to get bigger and the U.S. slice getting smaller, I think at some point people in the U.S. are going to want to consider that world fund too. I talk to my daughter about this all the time because it probably will happen in her lifetime. I'm not sure that it's going to happen in, in my lifetime at, at this point. But I think at some point, you, people in the U.S. are going to want to make that transition. But if I were anywhere else other than the U.S., I would already have made it and gone into a world fund. Um, so yeah, one of the things that I know you you've spoken a lot about is you know fund fees and trying to keep them as low as possible or even rock bottom. Um, as a UK investor, you know I always get tempted to buy like an S and P five hundred fund or ETF as the cost is very low. Um, I think it's like seven basis points um, mm. versus an international all world fund, which is what I'm currently invested in, which is point two two percent. Um, the international fund is, you know, three times more expensive, um, and but obviously more diversified, and the fund is slightly less volatile, and returns are very good. How important are fund fees and keeping them as low as possible? Well, fund fees are are critical, um, but I think there's a point of diminishing returns. So uh, when you're at 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 point two two, you're those are pretty low fees. Now, as you point out, it's not as low as 0.07. I mean, in fact, it's three times as much, but you're already at a, at a pretty low number. That would be a tough call for me. One of the things that is making world funds more tempting to me is that the ones available in, in our market, at least, 
the expense ratio that we're talking about those fees have dropped. So right now it's at 0.1, I think 10 basis points was the last wow. time I looked at it. Very good. Now my VTSAX is at 0 0.04. So that's still, you know, two and a half times, but when it gets down that low, I, I don't think fees at that point would keep me from making the change. It's more of a strategic decision. But, you know, when, when indexing first came on board uh, and it was actively managed funds were the main things people were investing in, well, you know, those were sometimes carrying fees of one, one and a half, two percent, just huge. And I think the first index funds came in at like 25 basis points or something, a fraction of it. And since then, you know, the, the prices, the fees have dropped. Those were, were large differences and significant ones that were well worth lowering the fee on. But the lower the fee goes, the less total dollars you're really talking about. Okay. And um, how important is diversification in investing to you? Well, I think diversification is is very important, but when I buy VTSAX, I'm buying about 4,000 companies, right? I'm buying every publicly traded company in the United States. When you buy the World Fund, uh, and I forget the, I think it's VW, yeah, I'm not even gonna try to guess it. VWRL in the UK, uh, yeah, we call it, but yeah, it might be different. Yeah, that's got like ETI or something like that in America. I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, that's got ninety five hundred companies in it. So yeah. these these funds are hugely diversified in terms of equities. Yeah, whether you want to diversify beyond equities is a different diversification question. And again, the only diversification I feel a need for is at certain times in your in your life, you might want to add the ballast of bonds. Um, but I don't feel a need to diversify into things like crypto or gold or commodities or all of the other range of things that are artwork or what have you. Uh, those things are more speculations because you're buying something that you are hoping somebody will be willing to pay more for in the future. You might be right, you might be wrong, but there's no intrinsic value in those things. Whereas if when you're buying equities, you're buying pieces of operating businesses that have the potential to grow and expand those operating businesses and their profits. You know, when you buy bonds, you're lending money to governments and businesses, and you know you're going to get a, a interest rate paid on that that you don't get on your gold investment or your art investment or what have you. So I just I'm not interested in those kinds of things. Um, that's good to know. Um, obviously, I realize you can only speak from the U.S. perspective perspective of tax um, tax vehicles as, as obviously you're not living in the UK uh, but in the UK there are two main tax shelters for investing which are our pensions or self-invested personal pensions uh, which I believe in the US is the 401k or the IRAs um, or a stocks and shares ISA which I believe is a, a US Roth IRA. Um, do you have a preferred tax vehicle or shelter in the US and why? Well, so I, I, I'm going to take your word for it that those are the equivalents. So in the U.S., as you alluded to, we have employer-based plans, which are things like 401ks or 403bs, which are if you're a government employee. Um, and then we have IRAs. And both 401ks and IRAs come in as traditional versions or as Roth versions. And in the US, a traditional version means that uh, you get to deduct the amount of money you put into the fund. So in a traditional 401k, if you put in $10,000, you get to deduct that from your income and that's $10,000 you don't have to pay tax on at the moment. Um, but when you withdraw the money, you have to pay tax on that and you have to pay tax on anything that it's earned. 
So, of course, the question that you have to ask yourself is, when I retire, am I going to be in a lower tax bracket than I am now? If you're in the same tax bracket, then mathematically it doesn't make any difference whether you invest in a Roth, and I'll explain Roth in a second, or in a traditional. Right? You're going to get the same end result. You only benefit from a traditional if you wind up in a lower tax bracket. And the challenge there, of course, is tax brackets change and personal situations change. And, uh, you know, it's hard to predict whether what tax bracket you're going to be in. And the younger you are, the further out you're trying to predict, the, the trickier it is. So a Roth in the U.S. means you don't get any current tax deduction. Uh, you have to do it with after-tax dollars. But once it's in the Roth, it will never be taxed again. And none of the money it earns will be taxed again. So in some ways, that's the safer bet, because then you don't have to worry about what your tax bracket is coming out of coming out of it. Um, now, cynic than I am, it always occurs to me that the government could decide to figure out some way to tax that Roth money. And, you know, when people, you start hearing reports a couple of decades from now of large amounts of money accumulated in Roth accounts, and the government's looking for new revenue, you know, again, there's, when it comes to taxes, there's nothing guaranteed other than they're going to be taxes. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so you're always, with any of these things, you're taking a little bit of risk because you don't know what, how the government's going to change the rules and you don't know what the tax brackets are, are going to be. Having said all that, I still think they're a great thing to do. Um, and in the U.S. at least, with 401ks frequently, not always, but companies will do what they call a match. So they might match up to 4% of whatever you're contributing. Well, that's free money, so you certainly want to want to do that. But overall, I, I you know, I, I kind of wish they'd never been invented <laughs> because, you know, the it just complicates things dramatically and it, it it allows the government to you know they, it's it's the governments are trying to influence our behavior and i guess in this case they're trying to get people to save for retirement so i suppose that's a good thing but it seems to me the simpler way to do it is just to lower taxes on investment returns that would encourage people to invest without all of these complex programs that they've come up with yeah, I mean, just to give you an example of um, the UK, um, our workplace pensions or, you know, we, similar to the US, we, we you know, a lot of the time you do get the uh, employer or company match that you can, you know, pay money into and they'll match it. Um, we also have 25% um, tax free whenever we uh, withdraw our pension. Mm -hmm. um, and that can either be taken as a lump sum or, you know, gradually kind of thing. So you, you would should in theory only pay tax on 75 percent of your of your pot but obviously that's as you say it's always subject to change you know that could right. be sort of taken away that kind of thing um the ISA which I mentioned um is more like um instant access so you can still invest in you know Vanguard funds but obviously if you you know don't want to wait till 55 or 57 when you can retire um, you can pull that money at any time, so it's a bit more flexible. It works really well, obviously, for early retirement, um, but obviously not not to forget the benefits of a pension and why you should still contribute to ideally both. But yeah, that's yeah. kind of how it works. You know, a great a great example of how they can and do, and again, this is U.S. based. They can and do change the laws. Is a couple of years ago, uh, there was a change in the law, and it used to be. If you had an IRA, a traditional IRA, uh, in the U.S., when you get to a certain age, you have to take what's called required minimum distributions. And I think that age is now 73 or something. And that means that you're forced to take money out of it because the government wants to begin to collect their taxes. Well, the good news used to be that when you died, your heirs who inherited your IRA or your 401k, they would have to begin taking 
those required minimum distributions immediately, but these are prorated over your lifespan. So typically, if you're leaving something to your children, they are going to be considerably younger than you are when you die. So maybe they're 40 years old and, you know, it's prorated over 60 years. So the amount they're taking out is much smaller, forced to take out is much smaller. So the tax hit every year is equally smaller. Yeah. Well, the change they made in the law was now if you inherit an IRA, you have to deplete it within 10 years. Well, that's a huge change because, again, let's assume that your child is 40 when they receive this inheritance. Now they're going to have to deplete it between the ages of 40 and 50. And for a lot of those people, that's their also their peak earning years where their own income is the highest. Yeah. yeah. So now they will be paying it the highest tax bracket on this IRA coming out. And it'll be, if it's a fairly large IRA, it will dramatically inflate the amount of money they have to pay tax on for the 10 years when they are the highest earner. I think it's reprehensible that the government made that change, but it's legal. And, you know, that's what our representatives voted for. And they kind of slipped it through without very much fanfare, you know. So those are the kinds of things that can happen that worry me about these programs long term and also if you're like a couple as well that if you um if if sort of you inherit money from your partner you know if you know anything unfortunately was to happen um you know before you had the the double allowance that you could utilize and obviously now you have more money but you may not have the same tax advantages you know that you can both utilize your your annual allowances that kind of thing yeah, it's the same thing in the U.S., right? If if you are married, you you're in different tax brackets than if you're single. Yeah. Well, and obviously, if your spouse dies, you know, suddenly you're single, and you're in a much higher tax bracket all of a sudden, you know. And so, yeah, there's there's lots of nuances that that affect investors and in, in these accounts. Um, just along that that lines, um, as we mentioned about, you know, withdrawals and um, that kind of thing, do you have any preferred strategies for drawing down a portfolio in retirement? Um, examples of this could be, you know, switching from accumulation funds to income funds to pay out a dividend quarterly, um, you know, timings of your withdrawals. So if you did, I don't know, every month or every quarter, um and then obviously, you know, using that to keep for some cash for day-to-day -day expenses in retirement. So I wouldn't change the my investments. So I wouldn't go into a dividend fund, for instance, to okay. accommodate that. But a couple of things I would do. So when you're accumulating your wealth, you should have, in my opinion, your any dividends or interest on your on your stock and bond funds, those should be set to reinvest automatically. So you're acquiring more shares. But once you're living on your portfolio, one of the first things I would do is change that. So your interest in dividends is being paid into your into your bank account or your checking account, because there's no sense in having that automatically invested only to sell shares. So that's the first thing I would do. So if you're thinking about a typical 4% withdrawal rate, which is considered sustainable, uh, using, again, forgive me, but because I'm familiar with it, VTSAX uh, pays about a percent and a half dividend. So what I would do there is, is I'd have that dividend put into my, directly into my account. And now I have to come up with another 2.5%. And just to keep things simple, let's assume I only have VTSAX. Well, now I would calculate how many shares I need to sell, and I would instruct Vanguard to sell that number of shares to make up that two and a half percent, and put that into my into my uh, checking account to pay my bills. And I could tell them to do that monthly or quarterly or annually, whatever my choice was. I think I'd probably go with quarterly because that's how the dividends, well, actually, sometimes the dividends are semi-annually, but I think that's how I would do it. 
The other, only other thing I would offer <clears throat> is for people who've accumulated, as frankly I did, <clears throat> excuse me, um, some individual stocks that maybe they wish they hadn't, but nevertheless yeah. have capital gain built into them and they haven't wanted to take that tax hit. Well, now is a good idea once you give up your earned income because you're retired. Now is a good idea to start unwinding those positions. And that might be the first thing I did was start selling off those shares to, to live on. Okay. Uh, a difference, I think, might be the case, but I'm just reading between the lines. Um, in the UK, if you buy, for example, a, a global tracker or a world fund or even a USF SMP, uh, we have two versions of the funds. So we have the accumulation only version, which just, you know, reinvests the, the dividends automatically. Um, or you can get the income version, which, you know, is, is paying out dividends. Um, you know, ideally, it's somebody that might be in retirement. Um, or if you hold it outside a, of a tax protected account, it, it makes it easier to kind of, um, you know, to, to, yeah, to sort of like for taxes and things like that. Um, but yeah, it sounds like, um, because one of the advantages to picking an accumulation fund in the UK is um, if they do pay out dividends and, for example, there's some underlying foreign transactions happening, it, it by, by picking accumulation, you can avoid that mm. uh, just in case your broker charges you some kind of FX exchange. Right. Um, so I, I prefer accumulation just because I'm obviously in the accumulation stage, but Obviously, one day I'll have to switch it to the income version of the global tracker to get, a, you know, a quarterly dividend paid out, sort of from the tracker. So, is it is it a taxable event when you switch from fund to fund? In a pension um, or a self invested pension, event, it's not a taxable event, and it's the same as an ISA. It's all tax protected, so you can. But gotcha. but yeah, correctly outside of an ISA, so in a general investing account, we call it. Um, that that would be a, as you say, a taxable event kind of thing. So by taxable event, we mean you sold shares and you have to pay capital gains on any yeah. gains. Yeah, exactly. The nice thing I didn't realize that, and the nice thing in the U.S. is they're not separate funds. It's the same fund. You get to choose: Do I want to have my my uh, dividends reinvested? Yeah. Or do I not? And it's just a a click to change back and forth and. You're not switching funds. You're just changing where they send the dividends. Yeah, because some people do prefer the income version, as you say, because they like to get the dividend for the psychological boost and they might want to reinvest it themselves when they feel like or, you know. Um, so, yeah, it, it, people do either or here. But I think income's designed for retirement, but obviously accumulation um, I, I think it's just easier because you haven't got to worry about the dividends. But but you're right. Even if you have the income version, you can set up auto uh, reinvest. Um, some brokers do it for free, like Vanguard. Uh, but if you're with a, other brokers, they may charge you like I don't know a pound fifty a month to do it or something like that. Yeah. Kind of thing. It, it's interesting to hear the differences between the two systems. They're they're so similar in in most respects, but there are different nuances. You know. Definitely. Um, yeah, so um, one of the things I learned from you is obviously the importance of, you know, debt-free living. Um, there are still obviously a lot of people out there that, who really want to invest as much as they can, um, but, but doing so before they've cleared debt. Um, please explain why it makes so much more sense to get rid of debt before investing. Well, I, I would say it sort of depends on what your interest rate on the debt is, right? So as a rule of thumb, uh, I kind of think if, if you have debt that is 3% or less, uh, your interest rate is 3% or less, then I wouldn't be that eager to pay off that debt. That's pretty cheap money, and your investments can pretty comfortably be expected to earn considerably more than that. So in that case, I'd probably be paying off the debt slowly and investing the extra money I had. On the other hand, if that debt was five or 6% or higher, then I would definitely be focusing on paying off the debt. Even though, at least in the US, you know, the, the stock market 
returns typically eight ten percent a year but it's very volatile and when you pay off debt you whatever your interest rate is that's the rate of return you are getting so if you've got a six percent uh, interest rate that you're paying off uh, that's a guaranteed return of six percent and that's not bad for a guaranteed return and of course if you're talking about credit card debt well, that could sometimes be 18 20 plus percent well those are obviously things that you want to pay off immediately because you know that kind of return is is unbeatable right so depends on where your debt lies and then of course the other question becomes well what about if i have an interest rate between that three and five or six percent what about that debt and that's kind of the middle ground where i think it 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 can go either way and it sort of depends on how you feel about debt i abhor debt so i would be inclined to, to absolutely pay it off even at those lower interest rates uh you know it would take a very low interest rate to make me willing to hold debt and even then i I'd, I'd hesitate but that's those are personal choices those separate from just the the numbers which i think should take take precedent yeah because my only thing with paying down debt is obviously if you get a match from your employer in your job um, so say you put in five percent and they'll match five percent or different tiered system I always think that it's hard to miss out on the free money especially it's like a hundred percent return but but again it would depend on how bad the debt is and as you say the interest rate obviously if it's credit cards and what have you it's 20 percent. it's as you say it's like an emergency you've really got to got to look to clear that but yeah. i think that's, that's the only exception but yeah that's a great point on the on the employer match because that is up until that whatever they'll match that is an immediate 100 percent return and that's pretty hard to beat so that would probably be job one is to is to do that and then turn your attention to the debt. But yeah, the idea of carrying something that's 18, 20% interest rate just makes my skin crawl. I've said it's like you know, having debts like being covered with blood sucking leeches. And I don't know about the UK, but in the US it's become acceptable. It's yeah, same. expected that you will yeah. carry debt. And that, that's appalling to me. I mean, it's it's, Again, you're walking around covered with blood sucking leeches. How is this acceptable? I, I, everyone, I everyone here is sort of driving around like quite new cars. And, you know, a lot of the time it is just, you know, borrowed money kind of thing. And sometimes they don't even own the car. They just keep renewing it. And, you know, you never get to own it. But yet you you look good in, in a new car, I suppose, going around. But yeah, it's 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 just uh, as you say, it's accepted now as being normal to to do that. Yeah, you know when it when it comes to cars, somebody pointed out that you know people are driving around in fancy cars. They're driving around thinking everybody's looking at me and thinking how cool am I? But the truth is, if they're looking at you at all, they're looking at you and they're not thinking how cool you are. If they're thinking about you at all, they're probably thinking about you know look at that jerk but <laughs> what they're thinking is how cool would i look driving that car <laughs> they're not thinking how cool you look driving that car. <laughs> thinking about how one. cool they would look driving that car so, yeah i mean if you're if you're driving a fancy car because you think people are gonna are gonna look at it and think wonderful thoughts about you you're probably delusional um, on the same theme of obviously trying to get the newest and best car, um, another sort of very popular thing in the UK and no doubt in America is is home ownership. Mm. Um, you know, obviously at the moment there's a lot of high interest rate mortgages available. Um, you know, I just call the, the the home ownership the main religion of the UK and Ireland, as as it's very hard to stop people thinking of it or following the script of buying a home. Uh, you know, when sometimes there are cases when it makes more sense to rent, uh, we have sayings like an Englishman's home is his castle and tons of property shows on TV all the time. Um, yeah, what's your thoughts on, on that? Well, first of all, it, it sounds like it's the same thing as in the U.S. I mean, we say the same thing in the U.S., you know, a man's home is his castle. Owning your own home is the American dream. It 
it is in many ways the American religion as well. Uh, and I think that's all nonsense. I think, you know, houses are not an investment. And the, the most infamous post on my blog is a post titled, Why Your House is a Terrible Investment. Yeah. It's a post that's gotten the most views. It's also gotten me the most hate. <laughs> uh, but I, I think yeah, I think there is a, a real myth that's put out by the real estate industry that houses are an essential thing for people to own and that it's a great investment and that's how you build wealth. None of those things are true. Sometimes, of course, you can get lucky and buy in a certain area that, for whatever reason, appreciates dramatically. Uh, in the U.S., that might have been San Francisco uh, 10, 20 years ago. But you could also buy in an area that depreciates dramatically. In the U.S., that would have been Detroit 10, 20 years ago. If you'd bought then, you would have gotten decimated. So, and of course, who knows, 10, 20 years from now, Detroit evidently is going through a renaissance. I now hear about bad things happening in San Francisco. Who knows, 10, 20 years from now, maybe people will think, be thinking, oh, those poor people who bought in San Francisco, you know, they got killed, and the, those smart people who bought in Detroit, and I'm not predicting that, but... yeah. Yeah. The point is that I don't think you should think of your house as an investment. I see houses as an expensive indulgence. Yeah. Now, I've owned houses for most of my adult life because I could easily afford them at the time and because they provided a lifestyle that, that I was willing to pay for at the time. Uh, sometimes it was being in a school district when my daughter was young. Uh, sometimes it was just that we happen to like a given house, but I never thought of them as being an investment. They were always an expensive indulgence. I have nothing against expensive indulgences as long as you buy from a position of strength, which means that you can easily afford whatever you're buying, whether it's a house or anything else. You're buying a house, you can easily afford the down payment. You can easily afford the mortgage payment. You can easily afford the taxes. You can easily afford the maintenance. You can easily afford the renovations, which you will almost inevitably do if you own a house, right? If all that's true and it's how you want to spend your money, you'll get no argument from me. But for people who ex stretch themselves, stretch their budgets, you know, buy the most house that they possibly could afford, based on what the banks and the real estate agents are telling them and make themselves house poor, that is a very poor financial choice that will probably bring a lot of stress into your life as you try to deal with the expenses and it will be a big obstacle to actually building wealth. Definitely. Yeah, as I say, I, I speak to a lot of you know, youngsters over here and you know I try to talk to them about investing and what have you and they always seem to be really keen to like, you know, save a deposit for a home and they've never kind of like, you know, I think it's obviously pressure from your parents, you know, they might say, you know, when are you getting a, a house or, you know, why do, why are you living in a, say a one bedroom flat, you know, are you not going to get a, a proper house, they would say and things like that. So there's a lot of, um, you know, and they also like they they always say that our oh, renting is dead money that, you know, what you're doing, paying the, the landlord's mortgage, that's sort of things that you always hear. So it's kind of, you know, going in their minds all the time. Kind of thing. Well, you know, the thing about rent is, is dead money. That, that of course is nonsense. I mean, it's, you have to look at what you're paying in, in rent, uh, which is almost inevitably going to be less than, than what you're paying to buy a house. Yeah. Um, you know, there is there's a very strong cultural bias in both our countries, it sounds like, to spend money to buy stuff, not just houses, but buying consumer goods over overall. If you're pursuing financial independence, you are by definition doing something different than the vast majority of people around you. And it requires you to think differently. And so all that advice you're hearing, whether it be from your parents or just the, the culture around you that's telling you you have to drive this certain kind of car, 
make a certain kind of impression or you have to own a house or you have to do all these things, you're going to have to think differently than that common wisdom if you're going to achieve financial independence. And you're going to have to understand that most of the people around you are not going to understand why you were doing things the way you were doing them. Fortunately, my daughter, who is now 31, is still a renter, serves her needs well. It's much less expensive. <laughs> it allows her to build her, her wealth in VTSAX more aggressively. And as I've told her, at some point, if you decide that a house is something that you want, it's an expensive indulgence that you want to have in your life, well, you will be in a very strong financial position to acquire that house. You don't have to own a house to own a house in the future. Because that's the other thing people say, well, you know, if you don't buy a house now, 10 years from now, it'd be more expensive. No, that might be true. But if you don't buy a house now and you invest instead, your investments will almost inevitably grow faster than the value of that house. And so relatively speaking, 10 years from now, that house will be cheaper for you. I've heard you mention as well about, um, you know, buying things from a position of strength. You know, a lot of people, they'll buy, um, you know, homes, but they're not ready. You know, they haven't got like an emergency fund. They probably haven't really got started investing yet. And, you know, as you say, if you can, if you had the money on the side and then, you you know, you could yeah buy it when you're ready rather than just trying to jump on the boat, you know, because you're, desperate to, to be a homeowner kind of thing. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. You should buy everything from a position of strength, which means you can easily, easily afford it. And also when I, as I mentioned, I've owned houses most of my adult life. I've always owned houses that I could easily afford. Definitely. And that, of course, that meant they were houses that cost a whole lot less than the bank was telling me what I could afford or the real estate agent. Yeah, that's another problem. It's like over here, once you find out how much you can borrow uh, from the bank, you know, a lot of the time you'll 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 go to the limit instead of being, a, you know, as you say, getting one that you know that's adequate for what you need, kind of thing. You'll you try and get the the biggest house you can you can buy you can borrow money for, kind of thing. Well, you're being told to, you know, this is how much you can borrow. So of course, that's how much you want to borrow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there should be, in your mind, you should recognize there should be a difference between how much you can borrow and how much you want to borrow. And that should be a pretty big gap. You, you should <laughs> never want to borrow as much as the bank is willing to lend you. Definitely. Um, so you wrote your blog, The Stock Series, or on JL, JL Collins NH, um, to educate your daughter on investing who earlier in life, you know, obviously had no real interest in it. There are not many people really into investing. Most don't even know they are an investor, even though it's only through, the, you know, they could be doing it through their workplace pension or 401k without realising um, and couldn't tell you what, what you know, they're invested in, i.e. the fund. Um, as the time has gone by, has your daughter, um, you know, taken up much of an interest in investing? Well, I can't say she's taken an interest in investing, but um, because it's just not a subject that, that is of interest to her. And, and frankly, you know, people, Stephen, like you and me, we're the odd ones out, you know, that we find this stuff endlessly fascinating. But most people are like my daughter, who they know it's important. Thankfully, at this point in her life, she knows it's important, but they don't want to have to think about it very much or all the time. And that's why I wrote The Simple Path to Wealth, and that's the kinds of stories that you come across in Pathfinders, the new book. Um, because the truth is, with investing, all my daughter or anybody else needs to do is to understand a few simple concepts behind investing. You know, the fact that the market is volatile, and that doesn't matter over the long term. You don't have to do anything when it drops. You don't want, in fact, the only thing you want to do is stay the course and that you invest in these simple, low-cost, broad-based index funds. And that's kind of it. And if you understand that and then you set it up automatically, 
in your 401k or your IRA or the equivalents there in the UK or in your taxable account so that your the money is automatically going from your checking account into them. You don't have to think about it. You automate it. Now you're done. And that actually is your superpower. Because my daughter's not interested in this stuff, she's probably not even going to notice the next time the market crashes. And therefore, she's not going to be tempted to do something silly like, like sell, right? That's a superpower. Investing is probably the only area of human endeavor where if you get these couple of basic things right and set it up on autopilot, the less you do, the better, the less time you spend on it. So with the blog, I've learned that I have two audiences, right? I have audiences, an audience that is made up of people like my daughter who realize this stuff is important, but they really don't want to have to think about it all that much. And then, of course, I have an audience of people who are into it because it's a financial blog, right? And so people who are interested in that kind of thing are, are going to want to read it. Well, those are the people who are forever telling me, hey, Jack, JL, the simple path is, is wonderful and it's great, but you know, if you just tinkered with it this way, or if you just tweaked it this other way, it would be even better. And I can almost guarantee that if you look at those people who are always tinkering with the simple path, and you look at my daughter's results after 20 years, I can almost guarantee my daughter's results will be better because she doesn't tinker. Because the more you tinker, the less well you will do. Yeah, because um, there's a good saying I heard quite recently, you're probably going to like, it's, um, you know, like at Christmas or, I don't know, you guys have Thanksgiving as well, where if you're cooking like a turkey, um, you know, you obviously set the time that you're going to cook it and, you know, you wouldn't keep going to the oven to check how the turkey's doing, you know. And a lot of people that are really into investing can you know, get into it too much and check the turkey when it's not ready. <laughs> and obviously, you know, for us, it's, your, you know, for your daughter, for example, she's, it's all just happening automatic. She doesn't have to worry about it or think about it. And as you say, she'll probably end up with better results than somebody that's logging in every few days to check how the market's doing. And um, I, I'm not sure about this global fund. I should switch it for something else or I should yeah. add small cap, you know, different things value funds you know you could it could never end doesn't it really you kind of second guess yeah. yourself you know and you can get bogged down and like we were talking about earlier you can get bogged down and you know the expense ratios the fees yeah. well once fees are are low below a certain point kind of i don't think you want to spend a lot of your time worrying about it you know pick pick the world fund if that suits your needs better or pick in my case vtsax but it shouldn't be driven by the fees. In in the U.S., you know, the people are always worried about, well, you know, is the total stock market index fund from Vanguard, which is what VTSA is, can I buy the total stock market fund from Fidelity or T. Rowe Price or some other company? Well, yes, because the total stock market index fund is essentially the same thing no matter who's providing it. So there's way too much time wasted worrying about that. Even, you know, should I buy the S&P 500 fund, which is the 500 largest companies, or the total stock market fund? Well, because these funds are cap-weighted, they inherently own more of the larger companies. So the S&P 500 makes up about 80 or maybe even 85% of the total stock market index fund. If you, I prefer it because I like having a little bit of of, uh, of mid cap and, and small cap companies in my portfolio, but that's kind of like adding hot sauce to a meal, right? Yeah. It's yeah. a little bit of spice, <laughs> but it doesn't really change the meal. So, yeah. you know, if the S&P 500 fund is, is what your 401k offers, you're fine. Go for it, you know. Okay, finally, JL, um, obviously it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Really great listening to, to you talk about everything. Um, just wanted to know if you had any exciting future plans that you'd like to share with the audience um, and also where would be the best place listeners can find you online? 
Well, the best place to find me online is probably the blog we've already referenced, which yeah. is jlcollinsnh.com. Yeah. Uh, and there you can find me. From there, you can find me on Twitter or Facebook, or and you can also find the books if you're inclined to to order them. Um, you know, right now I'm sort of coming to the tail end of the the book tour for the Pathfinders, and I've been doing a lot of interviews around it, and and of course it was two years in the making, and so in my immediate future I hope to be doing a lot of nothing for a while <laughs> <laughs> while I while I recharge my batteries, and then I'm not I'm not sure. I'll probably figure out something else to 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 keep me occupied. I, I actually have come up with an idea for still another book, but when I think about it, it's just a huge amount of work. And so it, it, it feels kind of appalling to even consider it at this point, but six months <laughs> from now, you know, when the, when the pain and the anguish of, of writing this book is diminished, maybe I'll, I'll turn my, my attention to something like that. Okay, great. Well, all right. Thanks again anyway, JL. And I uh, hope the listeners enjoyed. Obviously, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and YouTube channel. And uh, thanks very much for listening. Hope you enjoyed. Goodbye.